my good people of the third district, friends from other districts, friends and well-wishers tuned in on Facebook. As you know, we are streaming live. Members of the media, I am Julian Fraser, representative for the third district and member of Her Lord Majesty's loyal opposition. A good evening. This meeting tonight is being streamed live on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash Fraser.vg slash. Tonight I am pleased to have with me as host of this joint meeting, the BVI Red Cross, who is represented by their director, Miss Stacy Lloyd. Stacy, could you just let me see who you are? And Anisha Bruley, EVAC field officer. Stephen Passard. And evidently visiting in our midst this evening from the BVI Red Cross also is, uh, with the BVI Red Cross, is Philip Hand the resilient manager from Red Cross UK, and Bruce May, finance manager from Red Cross UK. Good to have you here. I'm glad that you had the foresight to come and see the good work your local Red Cross is doing and their interaction with the community. The BVI Red Cross has been engaged in an effort to address concerns for the vulnerability of the Sikorsba community and their threat of disaster since the damages caused by Hurricane Irma and Maria and the floods of 2017. As such, through a collaborative venture with the community, the Red Cross has been able to explore where these risks come from, which members of the community will be worse affected, what is available at all levels to reduce risk, and what initiatives can be undertaken to strengthen the capacity of people at risk and reduce the risk they face. This work referred to as enhanced vulnerability and capacity assessment will enable the Sikasa community to become more resilient through assessment and analysis of those risks and also by identifying solutions to address them. The Red Cross is here tonight to give you a presentation of their work and present the report to the community for action. As it relates to risk and all vulnerabilities, the Department of Disaster Management has also been active in the mitigating efforts as well. To date, they have engaged in several projects to that end. One such project was the establishment of a model smart community in Sikowsbury using sustained mitigation, adaptation, and resilient techniques, smart. There is a focus on the development of the Sikowsbury Marine Shelter using the Parakita Bay model, and also the application of the smart school demonstration model in the three schools in Sikaus Bay will demonstrate how that can adapt to climate change by instituting measures that create a green environment in which they learn and play. It will make the schools safer through the implementation of disaster risk reduction education and initiatives. DDM, disaster Department of Disaster Management is currently engaged in the installation of sediment traps in Albion Gut with the aid of the CDB grant. This is being done with the people, but this is being done with the hope that the troubling landfill in the Seacows Bay area at the mouth of the Albion Gut, which occurred during Hurricane Irma, will not happen in the future. They are also currently soliciting bids for the construction of a drainage project in the yard around this building. 
You no doubt would have noticed on your way in the early warning system on the grounds outside, which is also an initiative of the De Department of Disaster Management. And I have been informed that there will be one installation in the Hannah Palestina area soon. Tonight, after the Red Cross has completed its handover, it is my desire to apprise you and other district matters such as works on the Sikalsbeth Chalwell Road, Hannah Hill Road construction, Palestina Road stabilization, flooding at the Albion Gut, water shortages issues, the dredging of Sikalsbeth Harbor, and medical marijuana and the incinerator. I'd like to now introduce to you Ms. Ms. Mr. Stephen Passard, who will give you a brief presentation. And he'll be followed by Anisha Bruley, both of the Red Cross. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I would just like to thank the district rep, first of all, for allowing the Red Cross to make our presentation here at this community meeting. My role basically is just to give you guys a brief background information on the Red Cross and what we do. So the BVI Red Cross is part of an international movement, the largest humanitarian movement in the world, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. The vision of the BVA Red Cross is to mobilize the power of humanity so we can help communities better prepare and respond to crises. And in our fi new five-year strategy, one of the strategic focus areas is disaster management. And under the area of disaster management, we have resilience. So the EVCA process, it's ba we will basically help communities become more resilient to disasters and how they can mitigate risk in the future. The more information about the EVCA process uh, will now be shared with you by Anisha Bruley. Good night, everyone. As was said, my name is Anisha Burley. I am a volunteer at Red Cross, and also I am one of the field officers who was working on the Enhanced Vulnerability Capacity Assessment Report here in Sikosme. Firstly, I would like to thank our district representative, Honorable Julian Fraser, for his support throughout the entire process. Also, I would like to thank our partners at DDM for their support and also our partners at British Red Cross for their support as well. I would also like to thank you, the community members, because this project could not have been completed without your participation. Now, what is the EVCA? We already know that it stands for Enhanced Vulnerability Capacity Assessment. It is a simple process that uses different tools to help gather information. Information being on the different exposures that a community may have to a natural hazard and the different capacities the community has to resist this, these natural hazards. It also helps to create community-based disaster preparedness programs. This um, diagram just helps to better explain what the EVCA process entails. So the first question is, what is affecting us? And that would be your hazard or threat. And an example for Seacoast Bay would be, flooding is affecting us. Then you would ask, where is it affecting us? You would say it's mostly affecting us probably in the lower lying regions within the community. And that would be your exposure. Then you would ask, why is it affecting us? That would be your vulnerability. And then what do we have to face it? We can probably say we have guts, we have different drainage systems, and that would be our capacities. How does it affect us? And the main thing would be, what should we do about it? These are the actions, and this is the main part 
of the EVCA process. You want to identify the problem so, then, so you can then mitigate. Um, I mentioned that the EVCA process uses different tools to help gather the information. So this is a list of the different tools that were used to carry out the process. We have the historical profile, profile which simply just um, focuses on different past events that happened within the community. For example, different hurricanes that might have happened. Um, also, like when this community center was built, we have the seasonal calendar, which also identifies different events, but more like when is hurricane season, when is flu season. These information just helps us to gather everything and connect everything together. We have the direct observation and transect walk, which links to mapping. We usually draw an entire map of the community and we would, and we, we would point out, okay, so here, there's a lot of mosquitoes here, over there, they experience a lot of flooding, different things like that. Then we have the Venn diagram, which just helps us to connect everything together, helps us to identify the problems and find a possible solution. Um, in the report, we had high risk, medium risk, risk. In this presentation, we are only going to focus on the high risk and the medium risk because those are the ones that you want to find a solution to, yes, or lower. We have, so a risk is considered high if the community has higher exposure to a hazard, have a high vulnerability to, ha to a hazard, or if it has low or medium capacities to deal with the effects of the hazard. We had three different hazards, the first one being hurricanes, of course, because we do live within the hurricane belt, so once it is hurricane season, we will be affected by it. Here within the community, we have a few members who are trained in force aid and sort training. However, we, as Red Cross, we want to offer more classes in force aid training, and also we want to partner with DDM and offer sort training as well. We know that members are aware of the evacuation routes, the emergency shelters, and also the only warning system. Also, when we were doing our assessment, we realized that certain buildings within the community are still in need of repair, and that they also need to be upgraded, meaning they don't have hurricane shutters. The second one that we have, which is a medium risk, is flooding. Community members, mostly within the low-lying region, um, experiences flooding. Also, members who live on the higher region stated that whenever the, the rain flows down, it usually flows into their, house, their homes because the water doesn't have a proper place to run out. You can go ahead. And then our third one was mosquitoes. Community members have stated that there has been an influx of mosquitoes after the 2017 hurricanes, and also there is an increase of both waste and deliric vehicles within the community. Now, what are we going to do to fix these problems? Like I said, we want to offer force aid and sort training. Also, we want to offer hurricane preparedness programs within the community. We also want to install sediment traps in the guts, which our partners DDM is already doing, and we want to have regular cleanup as well. Um, environmental health, the vector control unit, they already help us with the mosquito problem a bit because they usually have fogging and they usually have treatment of the mosquito sites, but also there's something that we as a community can do, which is we would love to have regular cleanups because once you keep the area clean, you know, it will lower the mosquito breeding sites within the community. That's it. Um, also, the last thing, we would love to form a committee within the community to help us ensure that these actions are carried out. So if any of you are interested in a part of being a part of this committee, we are going to send around a sign-up sheet right now so you can you know, put your name and number and we can get in contact with you, okay? Now I am going to call the director of the British Virgin Islands Red Cross, Miss Stacy Lloyd. Um, good night to everyone of the third district particularly the Seacoast Bay community. Um, again, I would like to extend thank you to the Honorable Julian Fraser for having us here tonight and for allowing us to mingle with you guys in this entire process. Um, the information gathered is for you. It's to make your community more resilient. 
is to make you guys more prepared in the event of any crises or any disaster. Um, we really enjoy the process and um, we look forward to working with persons who are going to sign up to be part of the mitigation process. And that's just basically persons who are going to come together and help us to um, the different risks that were identified in the um, EVCAs. We're going to come together and prepare a team and solve these issues. We look forward to working with you guys again. And again, we just want to tell you thank you. And so um, now I'd like to turn over the report to the Honorable Julian Fraser. And then we have the report for you, the community. Again, this is your report. This is about you. And we'd like to turn over the report to this. Anybody in the back? Anybody in the room? So Christy from DDM has now shared the report with the community. It will go around the room. It's a very comprehensive report. But if you can flip through it, um, please do so. If persons want their individual copy, the Honorable would have um, copies to share with you, and we also would have at the BVI Red Cross branch in John's Hole. Again, thank you. I would imagine that somebody should have some kind of questions for the folks of the BVI Red Cross. This, this project is a first for the Red Cross. Most of you would know the Red Cross for being there for you when you have a sick person that requires uh, home care. You would know the Red Cross famous for having this clinic that examines individuals for various types of ailments at a specific time of the year. But you probably don't know the Red Cross for getting involved in the community at this level. I've been fortunate to have joined them on two occasions to do a cleanup in this district. Yes, the BBI Red Cross was in the district on two occasions actually picking up the people's garbage. I know it because I was there. The last time we were there was August 20th, 24th. Put a four, four on it. I should remember because it's, that's a dead league open. But that's what the, the director is appealing to the community now to assist in helping yourself, really, because those initiatives that come from outside sometimes act as a catalyst to move you. If I call you, you may say, Mr. Fraser bothering me again, or somebody else calls you from the same community and say you're bothering me again. But when you see someone come from outside and doing it, you get that extra feeling that you should be a part of it. So they talk about the issues we have, have with flooding. They talk about the issues we're having when a hurricane comes. People, persons have to be evacuated. How many of you know the, the different evacuation routes in case there is a tsunami, an earthquake, and all these different things? And that's what this program is all about. They talk about flooding conditions, how they are associated with the Department of Disaster Management in trying to mitigate against flooding in our own community. These folks at the Red Cross are prepared to work with us in this community because this this Cosby has been identified as one of the more vulnerable communities in the territory, along with East End and Yoswendike. There's three of us 
we are that vulnerable. So we want to stay on the cutting edge. While we have the Red Cross with us, let's keep them because they are thinking now about going to Yoswin Dyke and going to East End. But let's sign our names on the back, let them know that we were here first. And every time they take their clothes off, they have to see it. I turn in the mirror, they'll see, see Cosby on the back and they'll come back. And be hospitable as possible, as hospitable as possible as we are. We, you've been treated nice, right? Good. So, any questions that you may have, this is the time to pose them to the Red Cross. Like I said, I'll be getting into that other aspect of the district after this presentation is completed. So, take the advantage now and start and ask them any question you have. to see them. It's a privilege for us and it's a blessing. Please don't leave us. Come again. We are glad to have you. Okay, seemingly that your job is so well done then. Okay, you got someone to have a question for you. Good night, everybody. Uh, you said that you held meetings in the district in order to formulate this report. Uh, I don't know about other people, but I, for one, was not aware of any meetings called by the Red Cross in this district. Can you tell me what, during which period they were held? The meetings were held early around August, I would say. I don't remember the exact dates right now, but they were mostly in August. We had two meetings, and we actually came within the community, and we did surveys. But it is a large community, so probably we didn't get to meet with everyone within the community, but we tried our best to, you know, contact, engage almost most of the community. Okay, thank you. Okay, no further questions for the Red Cross? Thank you. One question, sorry. I just want to know what is the most needful thing when you're looking for volunteers, what do you need most from us? Um, to be a volunteer, um, what we need is your spirit. We need um, persons who are committed. We need persons who share the same visions of the um, British Virgin Islands Red Cross. And as you can see, we have our seven fundamental principles. And those pretty much is what we ask of volunteers. There's a process, of course. You, there's an application form that you are asked to fill out. Um, we also um, have a code of conduct because, of course, we expect our volunteers to operate within our seven fundamental values and to represent the Red Cross to the highest that they can. And so basically, that's the criteria. A willing spirit, commitment, and just that ability to want to give back to the community. That's pretty much it. Thank you. I hear you on that. I was um, wondering um, more specifically in regards to what will be done within this area here, this district. Because I am thinking that you're here in order to work with this district on these issues that we're having that we spoke about. So what was most needed? Well, there's a form that's going around and we're asking persons who are interested in helping with the mitigation process to sign their names. And the idea is to form a committee. And so these persons who are interested 
will meet regularly with the Red Cross and the community and help to, act, to, to come up with an action plan to, to mitigate the different risks that were identified in the reports. Good evening. Uh, it was mentioned that Sea Cows Bay is one of the most vulnerable communities, and we're talking about mitigation. What, what um, are the factors that have uh, made this community so vulnerable? Hold on. Um, the factors that made it most vulnerable is because of the flooding. That's one of the main things. And then we do have the problem with the mosquitoes, but it was mainly the flooding. That was the problem. A more, a more uh, detailed description on that quest to that question talks about us being more vulnerable to Sikola community in, is particularly vulnerable to flooding, coastal impact from situation or uh, from siltation, I should say. Tsunami f inundation and landslides from the surrounding hillsides. It is also susceptible to coastal surges. You know, Sikos Bay before Hurricane Irma had a certain degree of protection from the mangroves that, that, that has disappeared during Irma. And we are even more vulnerable now because of that. I think that us, all people in the Virgin Islands in general, are so preoccupied with their own personal problems brought on by the hurricane that those things that we took for granted that are so necessary, such as those mangroves that I'm talking about, go unnoticed. And it is community, it is organizations such as the Red Cross that has a, a view from the outside to remind us of our vulnerabilities. And I, that's why I think that their presence and their involvement is so key to us getting back to where we were. I was thinking about it, and the only analogy I could bring to mind is one that I think most people can understand. You know, the BVI was a, a community that has been built, uh, was built over, over, over decades. Decades. Those of us who were around in the 60s would know that prior to that, like 1950 or so, it was just a dirt track along here. You want to go to town, you, 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 you catch a donkey or you walk. And those of you who came along in the 70s gets the impression that it was always this way. After Hurricane Irma, it, it, the analogy that I have is that if, you, if someone was ca who carried a, a, a child full term and lost that child, didn't know how to make babies, didn't know how to make children, so they could just start over again and just What happened to us, though, with Irma? We just can't start over again because everything that we had is gone. We no longer know how to do it. We got to start from scratch. That whole process of learning has to start over. And that's the difference. So anytime you look at, if you look around and you start saying, well, you know, all our problems with Irma is just about behind us, that is not true. There are lingering effects. It's going to take decades for us to get to where we were before. So while you are preoccupied with your own personal tragedies, let's take 
the advice and, the, and the, 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 the help that we can get from organizations like the BBI Red Cross and build on it. I'd like to recognize the presence of the leader of the opposition, the Honorable Marlon Penn, representative for the 8th District here this evening with us. Thank you for coming, sir. Yes. As a native Sikaubeyan, if I can say that, I have been away for 40 plus years in the United States. And I've been back now two and a half, going on three years. And when I look around, I mean, I used to visit on a regular basis. I come down for two weeks and spend some time and tour the island. But I look around here, this does not look like Sikaubey Bay that I know about. Um, since the hurricane, we have all these boats in the water. We have some of them, they're like an eyesore. When are they going to be removed? I know it's been, it's almost, it's going on three years. The hurricane occurred in September. I had just moved back about six to eight months when it occurred, unfortunately. I mean, that was a nice greeting back home. But, um, so I'm wondering, what are we doing to clean up our waterways, all the boats? We are allowing so much landfill, and some of them look so distasteful. I live up on a hill, so I can see all this mess. The old trucks along the way and old vehicles that are abandoned and parked anywhere. I mean, it's not just here alone. It's, it's throughout the whole island, but I have to speak about Seacows Bay. And I'm just wondering what is being done. How are we planning to get this place looking like? I guess it would never look like Sikau's Bay that I know or knew, but at least something that is half decent because right now it looks like a, I don't even want to say. It doesn't glad. look like a place I was born in. I'm sorry to say. But, and those of us who are here, what can we do about the littering we are doing? Because that we can work on. We can be more involved in cleaning up the environment, stop littering, stop throwing things around, especially garbage or items that's not going to, as it were, the, what, what is the word I'm looking for? That is not going to disintegrate naturally like paper that would, but plastic and all these styrofoam containers and all these trucks. Have, I walk every morning just about. Trucks are passing by with boxes and various garbage that they're taking to the dump. And they're blowing off. What are we doing to make sure that this garbage is covered so it doesn't fly off or roll off in the streets? And who comes along to pick it up? Oftentimes I'm walking, I pick up stuff and throw it in the bin. So I'm saying it pains my heart. And I have not gotten to town to speak to any of the elected officials. Because I've been wanting to do that from the time I came back in 2017, before the hurricane. Because I don't like what I see, and I know we can do better. I know what our ancestors did. We didn't have, of course, all this disposable trash. But we were a tidy people. We trimmed along the roadside. We didn't have all this wild tamarind and waste product around the roadside. No, our parents and uncles and grandparents took care of this land. And what I see now, I am appalled. It seems as if, where okay. is our sense of pride? Okay, that's, that's, thank you for your question and your intervention. I think it was timely. You came to the right place and you, you, you did it at the right time. Because that's exactly what the Red Cross is asking you to do. Participate in the program that they have started in getting the place cleaned up. You talk about the vessels out in the harbor. Now, that brings me to one of the issues that I wanted to raise tonight. As we speak, there's some dredging going on in the harbor of Seacows Bay, as we speak. And it bothers me. It bothers me for several reasons. One is, there was absolutely zero consultation with you, the people of this district, as to what's taking place in that harbor. There was none with me. 
it's a lack of res it's a lack of respect for me, the district representative, a lack of respect for you, the people of the, the district. Now hear this. You know the last day, the last day, the government that was in office in the last administration had in office before election it was February 22nd. That was the Friday. February 22nd. Election was February 25th. And depends on who's keeping score. We already had elections on February 22nd because we had advanced polls. That government signed two contracts on February 22nd for the dredging in Sikorsky Harbor. Each contract at $750,000. $1.5 million to do what? I don't know. Your district representative didn't know anything about it. That courtesy was not extended to me. I don't think anybody know about it because it was done February 22nd when everyone was busy trying to get reelected or elected. I have been saying ever since the hurricane that a portion of landfill that was at the mouth of Albion got in the harbor, all of you have seen it, needs to be removed. With urgency. I have gone to the government and asked them about it and they told me they have no money to do it. It's only Monday. Monday just passed that I saw the contracts and when I saw them my jaw dropped to know what $750,000 is being spent on two times and I can't get that stuff removed. I think urgency requ requires that that stuff be removed and not the dredging of the harbor. Who are you dredging it for? Which one of you in this room has a yacht? How many of you going to benefit from the yachts that are going to come in there to park up? None? None. But I can tell you, I want to make sure I'm telling you the right thing. 19,000 square yards of mangroves were destroyed up there. 19,000 square yards of mangroves were destroyed there in Sikals Bay with the hurricane. No one is making an effort to replace them. Now that affects you. That affects you. And that stuff that's filled in the harbor up there affects you. That's the Sikals that the lady was talking about. That's the Sikals that she wants to see come back. And there is money to do it. Not the nonsense that they're doing. Somebody in Rotown sitting down deciding what's, what's supposed to happen in Sikals Bay. I told the minister of the day this morning that I'm coming here before the people of Sikals Bay and I'm going to tell them exactly what I'm telling you right now. And if we got to be back here in February, which is next month, with him here to put it in his head that this is what we want in this district, we're going to do it. But the people has to become active. Else, what's happening right now? The children that are being born right now, as I speak, would never know there were mangroves in that area. They would never know the beauty of Sikals Bay. Like I said, 19,000 square yards of mangroves. 19,000. I want to pass, pass this, this paper around. A track down the middle of the harbor, they said they wanted it to be 10 feet wide, I mean 10 feet deep minimum. Now, I have, I have absolutely nothing against the contractors who has the contracts for this project, 
but I have everything for this district. Those contracts needs to be redirected into doing the things that are necessary and needed. The same people who are dredging the harbor can be used to pick up the stuff that's there. That's urgency. That's the urgency of no for this district. And I told, I told the last government, no, I told this government, I told the guys that are in this government, I said, listen to me. You come into Sickles Bay, you try to victimize me, but you're victimizing the people. And when the people get fed up with you, they're going to get rid of you. Just like they did the last government. So you come in here and do the same thing, you're going to get rid of. Do the right thing. And that's a simple request. I think it's a fair request. Do what's right for the people. Do not come into a person's district and think you can do exactly what you want and get away with it. Those days has to stop. When you see, you see that, that the marking down in the harbor, that's, that's, those are the tracks where they're supposed to be dredging. Now at the top of the, paper, at the, the, at the drawing, on the right-hand side, of, it depends on how you're looking at it, 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 it looks like an L or U. Depends on what you're talking about. It's an A, B, C, and D. And they're supposed to be dredging in those areas. Now a dredge is not an excavator with a bucket that can scoop a nice trench out and keep going with it. You put a dredge down in the middle of this room, you can suck sand till Christ comes. It ain't gonna stop. To the guy who's walking around, he thinks that you're sucking sand right in the middle. But actually you're sucking sand from all around here, all around the edges. Wherever you got land, all that land you see up there the, 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 in Raven Bottom, that's going to cave right in. I've seen this happen down in, in Palestine. I've seen it. Land. I know the land because as a child, we used to have cattle and, and uh, not cattle, but, but sheep and vegetation growing. A few years ago, it was a swamp. Why? Because in Hannah Bay, they dredged Hannah Bay. Naniki dredged and dredged and dredged, and that land just became swamp. That's what's going to happen around here. I've said in the House of Assembly, and I'm going to say it here, too many people in this community are dying from cancer. And we know the reason. We know the cause. The government is responsible. The government is killing the people. And until we have, we have a situation where there's mold, We've been talking about mold for years, decades. When I went to the building, the Central Administration Complex in 2007, there was this quote-unquote mold issue. So we stripped the roof off the building and we put a new roof on, and the people are still complaining about mold because we never finished. They're moving like flies from one building to the next. Some people are staying home, they're saying they can't work because of the mold issue. I said until a group of people takes the government to court with a class action lawsuit, nothing is going to happen. And I will help. I'm encouraging them to do it because if government don't move, they have to, somebody has to do something. I'm not being sheepish about this. Not at all. So like I said, we will be back here next month, if not sooner, with the minister to discuss this project because it's urgent. One of the contractors is no longer on the job right now. I think he did a, a, a first phase of the work and is supposed to come back to do the remainder. But before he gets back to do the remainder, we need to have that project redirected into doing the things that are necessary. And I expect to have the support of the people of this district. This is your future. That little kid, that little kid there, I want you all to look at him. And if you don't do that, you're doing him an injustice. And I don't think you want that to be on your conscience. Yeah, tell them.
<laughs> yeah, sure. Dread out the harbor and how they touch a, a line that erupted and messed up both St. Thomas and Puerto Rico. They touch a wing of um, a well, uh, um, salami, took so much salami. It is terrible. And that's the same thing that happened to us here. Now, there are a series of other things that I'm looking at in the district. In the Sikulva Child Well Road, that's, that's the road out here that leads to Child Well. We were fortunate enough to get that bad section of it resurfaced. We got that resurfaced, and the reason it needed to be resurfaced was because the concrete trucks, as they ascend, they seem to have been spilling an enormous amount of concrete over a period, a long period, on the road. And those of you who had to drive that road know how dangerous it was. Fortunately, we were able to get that fixed. But I don't know how many of you use the road still. There is an awful section of the road that is undermined and needs to be re repealed. That's a project that has been in the makings. It's more than three years now I've been asking the government to do it. Finally, finally it's supposed to get started on Monday. Two contracts were issued for it and Monday works are supposed to begin. I'm not going to apologize for the inconvenience because the road was so bad you shouldn't have been driving on it in the first place. And to asking you not to drive on it would have been futile. I am expecting the road to be closed for a period. I don't know how long. Um, I should have known. The project should have started somewhere late last year. It didn't. And this communication seems to be a difficulty with government getting things. The Sikosba Childwell Road, that's the road right down there to the west. Yes. I hate that name. <laughs> we, I, I'm, asking, I'm asking folks to, to um, suggest a name for it so we can have it officially named. Because that, 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 name, that name has some connotations that are so negative. It's like it's a cliff. <laughs> and we, were, we, want to, we want to erase some of those stigmas. So yes, those of you who have, been driven, who have driven on that road for the last several years will realize that it's a dangerous situation there. If you are coming down the hill in a certain area and you don't know better and someone else is coming up, you might just happen to be a, a, a victim. So we're going to work on that. And it's going to be quite, quite delicate because you got, you got um, water lines, uh, flow, cable, and wireless. They put the fiber optics in there, I think it is. That's what the name is now. It's fiber optics. Some very delicate stuff. And it's going to be tricky to get it to get it fixed. So I am hoping that maybe maybe if I have this meeting in, in uh, February, I'll have more information to give you on it. Uh, I can put it put it out to put it out to you in the form of social media 
as to exactly how we're dealing with it. You would have noticed there's some kind of barricade on it as it is right now. Uh, someone put up some plywood, and that is because that area was critical. I just hate to see those plywood. I saw some on the Ridge Road, Long Ridge Road, been there for like eons, forever, and I, I didn't want that situation to, 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 to occur here in this district. So we're going to deal with that. Um, at this particular time, uh, leader of the opposition, I think you, you, got, you, got, you got saved. I just I want to recognize the Minister for Health and Social Development, the Honorable Carvin Malone, who I, I hope he is rested because I'm going to call him right now. <laughs> you have had, you have had, you, you, you locked in, I should say. All you folks, you are first. We've had a situation, we have a situation on hand where there is this coronavirus in, in, in China. And like everything else, everyone takes things for granted and just hope it go away. But this one seems to be mushrooming and blowing up and it's reaching far into our communities. It's in Europe, it's in the United States. Only God knows where, where, where else. So the Minister for Health is here, fresh from, y'all had a meeting, right? Yes. <laughs> and and I, you, you can appreciate why I couldn't make it. I'm here sweating. <laughs> so I'm going to ask the Minister to give you a report on, on that, what the government plans to do, uh, is planning to do about the virus. And while he's here, while he's here, we'll take the opportunity to talk to him about the incinerator and the derelict vehicles and all those things that the Minister for Health is responsible for. You could touch, touch on NHI if you wish. Minister. Minister. Good evening, everyone. Great, so um, I am pleased to be here tonight to talk to you in what is of concern to each of us as residents here of the territory because at the end of the day, this is now a global issue, the entire corona virus. So I'd like to thank Honorable Fraser for inviting me, for having me, and um, as, we, as we go through the, um, the different plans that we have, we would see that there are a number of actions that we have put in place. I'd like to, again, acknowledge Leader of the Opposition, Honorable Marlon Penn, and is any other members? Not as yet. I'm sure other members will show. The, um, We've had a meeting today of the cabinet. They, we actually introduced, um, we had the head, the chairman of the quarantine authority, the chief medical officer. We also had the CEO of the hospital services administration. And they were presenting the various initiatives, and I must say, coming out of the meeting, we had a number of other suggestions which I would incorporate in terms of um, some of the ideas and initiatives that were pinpointed. We will incorporate it into the strategy that we have in moving forward. As you're aware, we have a, um, up to 170 persons now that succumb to this disease, um, but we do have cases of where 124 persons were released after being tested, after being found positive, and they were actually released after some form of treatment. Some nations have gone as far as taking their nationals from China and 
putting them in an area because there's a quarantine period of about 14 days. Dr. Scatliff is here, so he, he will nod every time. He will go this if, I, if it's yes, and he'll do this if it's no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he will just give me an incorrect sign. But uh, the fact is, is that um, we have to work together. So this is not just a quote unquote government initiative. This is, this is you, this is me, because all of our health and our well-being is um, involved in this. So we met on Sunday, um, members of the quarantine authority, and I was able to sign the instrument, basically the letter, um, putting this into action. And there are a number of agencies, some of which we got, um, once I place the message out, there were a number of people who were able to say, well, what about this specific authority? So in so doing, on Tuesday, there was a meeting of a number of departments and heads, including the Ministry of Health and Social Development, the Department of Information, the Virgin Islands Port Authority, the Airports Authority, Department of Agriculture, Customs, Immigration, BVI Health Services Authority, Department of Disaster Management, Environmental Health Department, Her Majesty's Prison, Royal Virgin Islands Police, and sorry, Fire and Rescue, Deputy Governor's Office, BVI Tourist Board, and the Department of Education. These various departments and bodies are responsible for large bodies of uh, persons, and getting the word out is very important. We have looked in terms of enhanced surveillance um, of acute respiratory infections. We've increased public health education and awareness, focusing on the 2019-2019 novel coronavirus. We have made recommendations um, recommending everyone to take preventative measures, such as proper hand washing techniques. It was only now that I know that um, Unless you are prepared to wash your hand properly, some said 15 seconds and others say um, 20 seconds. The, um, if you were to say your ABCs while you wash your hand, then you will have the technique in terms of the, the, um, the amount of soap you need and wash your hand, not just gently patted by proper washing of your hand. And all of these, um, all of these techniques will be going out even more encouraging the use of personal protective equipment by health workers so that you'll see these guys in the hazmat, all, almost hazmat type suits so that they will be able to protect themselves because health workers are the most susceptible to uh, the spread of these virus and you have to make sure that they are protected in every way. We'll be conducting training programs, implementing advanced processes for the effective management of ill passengers at all ports of entry. Now, the team, when they came to the table today, they didn't have an aggressive enough approach at the ports of entry. So I've already on the way down because I had to drop someone up at the um, airport, sorry, at Trellis Bay. And I've already made calls and we have a number of equipment you, can, you know, can point straight at your forehead and temperatures and different things. So we are going to have that implemented. We're going to buy or purchase a number of these so that whether it's at the airport, the seaports, or the other major ports of entries, we'll be able to deploy persons who can um, use these equipment so that we can test for high fevers and um, after that, we can then monitor where you've traveled in the past days. So if, you, if you're traveling from a high-risk post and you have high fevers, well then, you then become a suspect and you'll be tested. Um, you know, additional tests can be you know, administered. So we're going to take ideas, we're going to take suggestions, and we're going to make sure that whatever is required to have the populace safe, sound, that it is done. 
We are going to meet also with the seaports and airports authorities and the health offices from various um, islands because our passengers, they come in through St. Thomas. They fly into St. Thomas and they come over here. They fly into Puerto Rico to come over here. They fly into St. Martin to come over here. Fly into St. Kitts from international posts come over here. So we want to make sure also that they are doubling up on the protocols so that at the end of the day, um, if they're doing the screening, then when we do our additional screening, we'll know that we have done all that we could to identify the various cases and make sure that this is done in a way that will be pleasing um, to the populace, number one, that would be prudent in terms of making sure that um, we catch it, catch it early, and we have this done. There is a quarantine area that we have to look at, at the various ports also. This um, is either going to be a fixed area where if someone is um, suspected and they're questioned, then they could be quarantined um, until when they can get them to a more permanent quarantine area for a 14-day period. If we don't have the space, then they have medical tents that could be set up and equipped for this particular purpose. So we're going to look at that also and make sure that this is done. So we have, to, we, uh, we have a way of um, getting this done. There's a full program ahead, and we're going to be pushing this forward. The, the schools, because at the end of the day, it is said that if you have a compromised health, health um, condition and you're caught with this, you then, you know, then is when the most danger is. If you have a healthy body and you get caught with it, it's, chances are you can survive it. But the elderly, they are most vulnerable when it comes to conditions such as these. So we're going to make sure that we protect my golden gyms. I always tell them that uh, since I'm closer there than where I was 20, 30 years ago, then I have a special interest in making sure that um, we protect um, our golden gems and not have them vulnerable to these. That is where we are at this time. You can rest assured that all of the international, WHO, the CAFA, all of the regional and international agencies um, we are in direct contact with. They're in daily communications with them. Um, the World Health Organization, they're meeting for fourth time to decide what level of warning they send out. They already have a, a, um, they already have a particular advisory saying there's a worldwide um, issue and they're looking in terms of additional measures that they would recommend as a result of all that is um, happening at this time. So we are working with the international agencies, working with the regional agencies, and working with all of the different groups. And if we, and if we miss any special group, then you can always, you know, I can always add it here, push a button, type in a few words, and, and we can actually have this done from tomorrow. So um, the agency is there, it is active, and is prepared to do whatever is required. That is that on that point. Any other issues you want me to? Okay, one or two questions here. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, do we have the capacity to test for the virus, or are we going off of identifying symptoms and forming a conclusion? Well, I'm told that this is a cold, it's a flu, it's a, so there's no, there's no, um, there's no specific symptom or test area because even in terms of getting the, uh, the known cure for it, there's none, but 
it could be in the form of a common cold, it could be in the form of flu, it could be in the form of this. So once you, once you, once your temperature is elevated, then you'll, you'll have to be questioned as to your last set of travels in the last few days so that you can then, um, you, um, it, you know, they can narrow it down. So do we have the ability? Yes, because it is one in which we do. You have to understand, influenza, um, and I'm doing the research myself, so when they come and, and it's actually, um, it is supported by the medical specialists. Influenza in the United States, for instance, I am told that over, was it 125, sorry, um, 30 million people, 15 million people have been, had the flu during this season. And there were over six to 7,000 deaths as a result of influenza. Um, you see that this is, this is a particular issue. We, every year, I'm, on, you know, I'm understanding that there is a specific set of vaccinations or medications sent in for the flu season because different strains or trains uh, happen from year to year. But in America, you would hear that the flu season is on, go and get yourself vaccinated. But down here, everybody's afraid of needles. A little needle, everybody's afraid of it. But it can save lives. So at the end of the day, um, we can then, so they have excess medication sitting at the hospital and nobody, nobody taking their flu shots. So you're invited to go to any of the clinics, you have one right here, go to any of the clinics and um, go to the hospital and you can get your flu shots and um, protect yourself from the common flu. Okay. We are, we are a vulnerable area in that it is so many islands. How are we able to monitor all our islands and who come in at night? We know what ha can happen. People come in in boats at night from varied areas illegally. How are we able to monitor those persons? Uh, do we have help from the United States Coast Guard? The United States Virgin Islands Coast Guard or whatever system to help us? Because yes, we have the airport, we have the ports with the ferries coming from St. Thomas. We also have those coming from um, Joseph Van Dyke and you have wherever else we have the day sales. But what about those other little islands out there that we know we pick up people from who are dropped off at night? That is a, that's more of a border control issue. No, I would but actually, if, they're coming, if they're coming in with... No, no, I understand you. But border control has been an issue throughout the particular region, uh, human trafficking, drug running, all of this and so forth. So yes, your point is well taken, but um, in terms of the surveillance, there is, you would hear from time to time, um, they have interdiction of persons being brought into the territory illegally. And this will have to be continued. But as it relates to whether or not deployment will be made as a result to catch anyone coming in illegal because of the, no, no, I understand you fully. So I'm, I know, they come in infected. So, I, so by the border control, we'll have to enhance that so that we can then look at this. Yes, sir. You mentioned about a quarantine area that is to be put in place. Uh, also, possibly a tent that is not yet in place. Is that right? Yeah, because uh, if we don't have a designated area or one is not available, then you can have a field triage type area. You know, you can okay. have a field. Uh, All right. Just wanted to make sure because. Uh, as we talk now, the, the virus is already active, even those things are not yet in place. My thing is, assuming that some, somebody comes in from one of those high-risk areas, naturally they're gonna have to be screened. Do, do you have anything in place to sort of uh, protect the 
customs and immigration officers who are going to have to screen such people? The answer is yes. They, they, um, they're the first line of training in terms of how to protect the frontline persons, immigration, customs, um, even the greeters, those that greet you at the airport and all of those. So, so there are specific conversations and specific provisions to help to protect your frontline persons. Uh, this is why the um, fire department, the police department, and all those are, are being trained in how to do this. This is not new to the quarantine authority because remember we had SARS. We had a number of other viruses that um, had entered our shores and they had to activate these measures before. So there was a protocol for um, how these are dealt with. You mentioned the um, Ports Authority. You haven't mentioned those two big words, which are your biggest front line. The two words are cruise ships. What are you going to do about screening? Are you going to rely on the cruise companies themselves to monitor their own passengers and keep them isolated? Or are you going to have somebody standing there with his little temperature measurer trying to measure 8,000 people coming off the ship? OK, great. The, um, the the comforting news about cruise ships is that they have a, a, a tighter protocol than any of the other um, sets of passengers coming in. They have to protect this because this is a closed quarter. As big as the ships are, holding six and eight and 10,000 people in those small quarters, they are, they are, in fact, called upon to do even more and we are one of the ports that requires a 24-hour notice from the cruise ship as to anyone who may have fallen ill for whatever purpose, and now so more than ever. You would have heard that um, internationally there were two passengers that were, had fallen ill on a cruise ship. Where was this? In Italy. In Italy. And the entire ship was quarantined so that they have the doers. In fact, I'm told that, unfortunately, I didn't take too many cruises, but the one I did take, you would see that they're wiping down rails and they're wiping knobs every second there because they know that it could be transmitted easily to this. So they have a bigger and a better protocol than a lot of other nations, island nations even. So that is that has been a question, that's been a concern, and that has been addressed. Minister, while you're here, can you tell us the latest updates on the, on the incinerator? Yeah, well, we're pleased to announce that the, well, you, you may have heard this, but if not, well, the control panel, the much talked about control panel, um, it has arrived, it's been installed, Constitutec, the equipment manufacturer, have sent someone here for the past two to three weeks. It's been tested. It is running. There are some mechanical issues because this heat that came out of the other, um, you know, of the fire, it affected other areas. So there were some water leaks because of some pipes or some holes that were that needed to be replaced. So since last Friday, it's been going through tests. So they. It was activated from last Friday. It is in um, better stead um, today. And they say that they're going to be able to run on a 24-hour shift to come. Uh, I think it's Saturday they intend to start to run 24 hours. But they, they have some mechanical, simple mechanical issues. Thank God, not major. But we then have this um, coming. It would then reduce the need to bury untreated garbage up on the, um, on, the, on the landfill. This untreated garbage consists also of empty or damaged propane tanks, and garbage itself have its own gases produced, and the spontaneous combustion. So it was not a program where they went and lit the fires 
in order to get a burn. They, they have it buried, buried, buried. But in these cases, wherever you have land filled, fires in St. Croix, fires in St. Martin, fires everywhere you have a land fill situation. And the only way to get this done is to go back to what you were doing, get the incinerator uh, moving. And you didn't ask, but I'll tell you that once we have this completed, Agency Red is a consultant company that are looking at a comprehensive waste management program and the concept of recycling must be put in place, reuse, reduce, um, rethink. We're going to reform our laws so that we can give it teeth in terms of um, the different ill stuff. I'm passing down and I'm seeing a, a 23 cubic foot refrigerator sitting on the side of the bin. Now, they could have gone down to the, down to the dump with that. They didn't have to take out the truck. They had to have some effort to take that out the truck and put it down next to the bin. Why not go and take it to, to its proper location? But this is, um, there, there will be constant fines until, improve, until performance improve. Here's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to align these fines or when the cameras go up, the number of the plates will go down, they'll be sent to DMV, and until you pay your fines, you can get your vehicle registered. Minister. We have to get this done. Minister, um, the other thing I'd like for you to tell the folks here is something that, something that some of them might be waiting to hear and can benefit them directly is your program for recovery. Those folks who still are still in need of material to finish the projects that were destroyed by the hurricane, how, how is your ministry helping them with that? Okay, great. You would know that when we were done inviting people to register um, with the department, we had over 695 applications that came in. When they reviewed this, it needed some over $35, $40 million. Fifteen was afforded um, to this particular program. And in order uh, for us to help those really in need, because it was not an insurance program. It was to help those who basically found it difficult to help themselves. So that was the first set in terms of mine. There were put in place back then a policy or a program where you have social assessment, you have the actual quantification of the damages, the amount of damages, and then they were rated, all of the applicants were rated, and those that, were, that had the highest score in terms of need, this was done. When we went in there, they had a specific program. When you went there in um, February and then March and April came, they had a program where $3 million was placed towards grants, $7 million was placed towards loans, $3 million towards social homes, and we had a program where the loans, no one that was suggested for loans, the bank would approve. So this money, this $7 million was sitting there and no one can get it. So we had to take it back to cabinet and repurpose that and put it into the grant section. But still you had the you had the assessment there necessary to be done. The figures will come out, the number of persons assisted will come out. In order to assist more people, not less, we had to, again, re reprogram how we looked at it. Because in the early days, you had some people who were granted 150,000, 100,000, 75,000, and the person who needed $15,000 worth of work couldn't get it. So we said, okay, fine, in order to look in terms of making sure that the scarce resources were spread as much as possible. We will do a roof and window and door and, and electricity program. We have a number of persons who benefited from that. But then again, there were people who were not qualifying. So we had to then, uh, with the kind and generous move of the, of the premier, we were able to put aside $1.2 million and offer 75 hundred dollars material grants. You would remember that in the early days of the program, there was a $2,500 material grant. But we found that we needed to pivot towards that. 
but we did not want to take the monies that were already short and put it towards that. So $1.25 million was placed in the material grant vote and it is still ongoing. But the issue is, is that you have to, it has to be a place you live, number one. You have to have some ownership or some connection with the property. You can't just not have ownership to it and then it's just qualify for it automatically. So if you are damaged by the storm, if you live in the house, if you either have ownership of it or if the person who owned it has passed, but you can show that you have some kind of, um, you're named in the will, you have something which connects you with the property, then you can get qualified for the $7,500 grant that is there. We were able to, um, we're able to use $250,000 of that for the month of December with pushing because remember, the treasury had closed from early, but we were able to have them extend it so that more people can get the help, not less. We also have right now um, about $650,000, $750,000 left in that particular program that um, if you qualify for it, it's not a refund policy. If you need the material, if you're damaged by the storm, if you have some connection with the property, then you can, there's an application form and we were trying best we could to make the process so that people can get the help they need and get it now. There are those homes, because they have been flattened, $7,500 in material will make no sense to them they're still going through some of the process so that um, the, the monies that are remaining in the grant program could be used um, to assist those persons even more. And they might well be, and um, your honorable member will be able to vote yes on this because if we need another $5 million, he'll vote yes. And he'll make sure that everyone in, in the third district can have access to it. Okay. See, I told you. <laughs> so. Good night, Minister. I'm Esther here, BVI News. Um, if we were to come face to face with the virus tonight um, at any of our ports of entry, what is the level of preparedness um, as a territory? Well, in the hospital, we have four quarantine area or rooms and so forth that we have. Number one, we have. Um, the healthcare administration folks have been already under guard because, as I'm saying, the protocol for this has been experienced during the SARS uh, attack. Um, and there are others, Dr. Dr. Scalif could tell me, you know, you know, the other viruses and the other epidemics that we had. But the hospital is ready in terms of doing this. We have, to, we have a 14 day, I am told, I'm informed reliably, there's, there's a 14 day quarantine period, quarantine period that we have. If we need to expand this area, there are provisions that we have already looked at as to where we can get additional rooms. We hope, we trust that this will never come to this and that we can then handle this appropriately. I want it. Good evening. Uh, just wanted to follow up on the incinerator question. What is the status of the air scrubber that was uh, slated to go to Pockwood Pond? The member here is a pessimist when it comes to the scrubber. He has seen and he has heard about this infamous scrubber. Um, how many years now? Too many years. Yes. I had discussion with Consutech, the equipment manufacturer, and they considered the fact that the scrubber, part of the payment was made about three, four, five years ago for the scrubber. When the, when the equipment was placed in, it should have been there. Their story was that um, the subcontractor went out of business and they then had to purchase this for a higher price. It has been the bone of contention for years. 
But they have assured me that during the first quarter, and um, Honorable Fraser will not hold me to this, he will give me a little bit more extension on this one. Um, because I came in, I met it. I'm going to deal with it. It's going to be, the scrubber is going to come exactly when I'm promised the first quarter in 2020. Um, by doing the scrubber, you would lessen the amount of pollutants that will emit even from the very incinerator. So this will give you cleaner air and even more environmentally friendly. Yes? Thank you. Minister, I want to thank you for taking the time to come to address your constituents. Yes. I want to remind you that these are the folks that put you where you are. <laughs> so thank you so much. Give him a hand. Give the minister a hand. That scrubber you're talking about, since 2007, we've been out of, we out of that scrubber and we've been reliably assured the scrubber is coming. So I, I'll be around to remind you. <laughs> I asked you for it at least. Okay, so let me get back to the little issues that we have in this, in this district that we've been trying to make sure we get done. Minister, I, I, I continue to remind you, continue to remind you that those golden gems that you mentioned are still relying on you to have them re back here in this community center. We are now up at the St. Paul's uh, Parigord Hall. One day, one day a week. And your program here used to be three days a week, which you and I are working on a five-day program because it gets pretty lonely as a, as a senior when all those kids are gone and you're broke. They don't need you. They don't come by as often anymore. So they need, they need, they need um, fellowship. So you were saying that you had some news on that? Well, in terms of getting the, the whole repairs done, are you on this, yeah? The, No, there's a program in terms of repairing all of the community centers because they they have been doubling as clinics. They've been doubling, well, tripling clinics, and um, where we have the program for the elderly, and we must get in at least a three-day a week program, and uh, if not five. But the windows have already been purchased. The the um, there's a contractor, the, the same contractor that did most of the work on this have been contracted. Um, and you should see work on this very, very shortly. And then the social development department have plan of action to get these programs. This center have always, has also been designated as a smart center so that uh, DDM and through the um, CDB funding, there are, there are specific funding so that it's, it'll be one of the advanced centers. So this center has been designated as a smart center. Um, so it will be connected properly. So when you use it, you can have uh, benefit of all the modern technologies. Thank you very much. Are you saying then that the sports equipment or the exercise equipment that was here is no. going to be replaced no, or restored? No, the, the, the gym, the gym was, was separate and apart from social development. That was a different entity. But there are plans to have a gym back into the, into the community center, into okay. the center. Thank you. Minister, the senior citizen, little, this little senior citizen hall is not to be muddled up with the rest of the community center, which is this big room right here and the one over there. That little part down there is one day when you come in, well, you're in Seacosby all the time. You, you, you spend your whole life in the third district. So one of these days you could just uh, come in and you see how one of those $7,500 can fix that place and get those seniors back into it readily. I know. I agree. I agree. 
I agree, and I'm sure the minister would agree too. Minister, you, you, you talk about the scrubber and you've been reliably, you reliably promised that it would come. Now, you, the, that, that private sector acumen that you have built yourself on, now you're in the public sector. You need to, you need to take that with you. You would have gone to Indiana, wherever that place is, and bring that scrubber here if you are in your private capacity. So don't just come back and sit down and wait for it to come because it's not going to come, Minister. I'm telling you. You got to get up there and get, bring it down, bring it back. Uh, you're you're actual, actually the Deputy Premier right now, right? Sorry, just, I never, I didn't remember to address you like that, but the Deputy Premier. Okay, now on to on to the, the Hannah Hill Road um, that I was talking to you about, the Sikorba Chalwell Road. That one is supposed to be starting on Monday. The Hannah Hill Road. In Hannah's, there is a road from Percy Benjamin residence up into the hills. It goes up towards um, Joe Robertson, Seymour Springett, Deniston Fraser, and it continues on and cuts through Mr. Gary Penn's yard. I mean, his, his property has been violated so many times because when you can't negotiate this hill here sometimes, you, you beg his permission to go through that area and come out bypassing the steep, steep area. But that road has been in a state of disrepair for years. Every time it rains, it floods, and root, dig the stuff up. We've been trying to put asphalt on it. We asphalted it sometime last October. That's October 2018. We, we, we asphalted it. And then the rain came and washed it off. And it continues to be a nuisance. I have put in place a program to concrete it this time. And concreting will mean that the, the, the residents will be uh, inconvenienced for two, a day or two, they won't be able to drive on it. But we have done such a project in December, in January 2018, we did such a program, project up in Cocodella, where the folks had to park their vehicle out at the main road and shuttle back and forth. We've done it in harbors before, so I've been in communication with the residents, and as soon as those contracts are signed to do that road, I expect to have a site visit with them to discuss having that road paved. Then in Palestina, again, with water and sewage pipe breaks to wash out the road and cause, the, uh, cause erosion, this is in the area of... Uh, uh, just at the foot of the hill to go up to Palestina. And it, it requires a retaining wall. And you who live up in Palestina know what I'm talking about. It requires a retaining wall. Again, as soon as we can get the monies de-reserved, minister, a de-reservation, it becomes, this has become a little nightmare now for us. They got the money, the money is appropriated, it's in the budget for, the, for these different projects. You go out and you get the contract documents, you get a contractor, but you can't get a purchase order because the money has to be de-reserved. I mean, somebody got to go and click a button and take the R, the R off the money so that it can get spent. So as soon as you can get that de-reserved, we will be able to, to get the that retaining wall uh, built so that the road can be safe for the motoring public, the motorist, motorists up in Palestina. There's one thing to note about these particular roads that I'm mentioning, the one in Palestina and the one in, in Hanus. It would come as a shock to you to know that these roads are private roads. All these roads are 
what you call estate roads because back in the day, there was no one living in Hannah's. And I'm not talking about a long time ago. Back in the 60s, in the 50s, there was no one living in those areas. Those are properties that people bought and built their homes after the 70s and 80s and, and 90s. So what happened is that, just like if you look across Manuel, you would see that the people that lives in that hill, that's not a public road. It's not a government road. It's, it, it's, those, are, those are private roads. And I, after coming to office, all those roads were paved since I took office. In Parkwood Pond, Harvard's, Palestina, all those roads were paved, Hannah's. But we, as a government, everybody looks to government to fix the roads. But they still don't understand that they're not public roads. And in doing these, in doing these works, we have to be very particular and very careful with the residents that live in these areas. And we need their cooperation. They, they, they look at you and they hold you responsible. They hold you responsible as government for fixing these roads. And I don't mind. All I'm asking is that you cooperate. Because if you push back too hard, I can hear the same thing that I'm saying to you in my ears. Honorable, those roads are private roads. And I would say to them, I couldn't care less. I want the road paved for my people to get access to their homes comfortably. And it goes like that in between going back and forth. And that's how we end up getting these things done. But remember this. Now, in order for them to become public roads, they have to be transferred from the estate owner to the government. And if that transition is made, then they become public roads. And it makes a difference between having a public road and a private road. But I'm not suggesting that in order for these roads to get fixed, they have to be public. I'm taking it upon myself to ensure that every resident in this community gets home as comfortably as possible. And that's my philosophy. I, I, I'm sticking with it. Albion Gut. Every time there is flooding, heavy rains, flooding, there are some residents that live by the bridge. This is on the eastern side of the bridge. Going toward, if we leave from here going towards town, the people on the right-hand side, that, those residents, every time there are heavy rains and any kind of flooding, those folks have to leave their home because the gut overflow its bank, the bank on the eastern side. And this has been going on for forever. I intend, I have, I have made promises to fix this for a while. And I think that the time has come now that it gets fixed. We have to raise the embankment. And again, any time now, as soon as I get my PO from the ministry, I can get the contractor working on raising that wall for the embankment on that bridge, at the bridge, the gut, along the gut, at the bridge. Water shortages. Everybody seems to be happy right now. I think that everybody's getting water. I'm not talking about the rain, but from the rain. No, not from the rain. Everybody's getting potable water. There are, some people, there are some people who are still being inconvenienced with the lack of water. They live, they live in the higher elevations. People up in Palestina, I know, up in the hills up there are not getting water as they should. If you live in Palestina and you came, when you come down by the main road, you will notice a concrete pad on the left-hand side. 
was placed there a few weeks ago, a concrete pad. That pad is to accommodate a motor, a pump, to pump water up to the high elevations for those folks who are not um, getting water. I can't tell you exactly when the pump is going to show up because it's a government project, so like, like the scrubber. <laughs> Hopefully it's going to come but, um, and not be like a scrubber, but as soon as that pump comes and we can get it installed, you, your, your situation will be better than it is right now. I spoke about the dredging of the harbor, and I saw, as we spoke about, we heard about the, the, the um, incinerator. We could talk about medical marijuana. Something strange happened one time. We, had, we invited uh, one of the high schools to a sitting at a, uh, of the House of Assembly. Regrettably, because of the tardiness of the government, it came, the government came so late that those children had to go back to school missing one of the most interesting part of a sitting, which is the question and answer session, so they didn't get a chance to do that. They were, they were able to sit and listen to that boring section though, where ministers give statements. And after that was finished, they had to go back to school, so we were taking photos with them. And I said to the children, you know, you don't need to get an invitation to come here. You can always come. The gallery is always open to you. And they say, yeah, we'll come back. But we need to know when you have, you're going to have your debate on marijuana. I thought that was so strange. I didn't know kids talk about those kind of things. So here we are. We are a government now talking about medical marijuana. I don't know what your position is on it. My position is that I don't know enough about it, so I can't give an intelligent, uh, uh, intelligent answer. I can't participate intelligently on the subject of medical marijuana. Uh, the BVI is still a small part of, uh, of society, and I don't know what kind of impact we will make in this market. I'm sure that the minister, the premier, and the minister responsible for the subject might have had discussions with uh, players in the market as to how this, uh, how this could be a vital aspect in our economy. If it is, then um, we will be able to talk about it in the future. I'm sure, I'm sure many of you might have your thoughts. Many of you might want to share your thoughts on it. But, and if you do, I'm, I'm open to listen. We have, the territory is, is still under a, cloud, under a cloud. Our financial services are still under attack. You know, we've just been blacklisted by the French again. Uh, being blacklisted is not a good thing. It sends a, a, a message that is uh, shrouded with negativities and it, it doesn't bode well for our industry. Does everyone remember what happens on January 31st, 2020? Everyone? Yes. What, does, what impact does Brexit have on you? For starters, before 2003, you were a, a citizen, a British citizen, and after 2003, you were granted a UK passport and then you became a United Kingdom citizen and also, by extension, a UK citizen. And with that passport, if you had one, if you got one, you were able to travel Europe free from any in, in, in immigration encumbrances and you were able to stay as long as you wish, work and do anything you wanted in Europe. I think that 
there is a one year transition period which is from which would expire on December 31st 2020 so between now and December 31st 2020 all your privileges remain the same after 2020 it all depends on what the negotiations are going to reveal what what's going to come out of the ne negotiations but i know that immigration is one of those issues that the british government is keen on making sure that they have control of so you may just lose your your privilege to go to europe without a visa and I, I, I didn't see any tears flowing from your eyes, so I guess it doesn't matter to you, sir. That's the same thing the British people feel. One gentleman in this room, he said to me a few years back that when the, British, when the United Kingdom joined the European Union, they joined it as an economic union. But over the years, it became a political union and they can't stand, it's not something that they should be able to, they don't want to stand for. The world is moving away from globalization back to nationalism. Could you imagine that a group of people in Belgium making laws for the folks in the United Kingdom and they have a huge parliament, you saw them, the, the way they behaved during the Brexit period. That whole parliament, they were just, just dogs barking without teeth because they had to adhere to the laws that were made in the European Union. Now they're going to get back their sovereignty and by extension, you get your sovereignty back, kind of. I can tell you I know because as a, an overseas territory, you know, we were all part of, the, of OCTA and OCTA was made up of all the overseas territories of all the European countries that has colonies like us, French colonies, Dutch colonies, and even Danish colonies, which is Greenland. So we were a union. And when we go to meetings, it wasn't the United Kingdom, which is our motherland, was making the directives. The directives were coming from the European Union. The British government was there as observers but the European Union was making, giving the directives to us. Now, that's no longer going to be the case. We're going back to dealing directly with the United Kingdom. I got into that to say what kind of impact this um, Brexit is going to have on all British Virgin Islands. Here's the thing. The British Virgin, Virgin Islands have been given the privilege to negotiate on its own behalf when it comes to financial matters, the fin in the financial services. That's one of the only things that we can do internationally. The British government has given us that privilege to do that. So we can go to any foreign country and negotiate and discuss our financial services matters. When it came to the European Union, we had Britain as a member of the European Union who had our backs. Now with Britain out of the, outside the European Union, when we have to negotiate with the European Union, we are alone. And that is one of the things that I think that the British, that the British Virgin Islands should ensure that the British government remains a part of our negotiating uh, regime when it comes to the European Union. We're just not capable of dealing with the European Union. It's too big. In December of 2018, the European Union imposed upon us what they call economic substance. And we had to pass legislation by December 31st, 2018 in order to accommodate the economic substance initiative. What economic substance is? It's not a little thing. It's a huge thing. And it's some, but it's something, it could, depends on how you look at it, it could make us or break us. I feel it can make us. There are those who are so pessimistic about it, they think it can break us. Economic substance says 
that if you are a registered company in the British Virgin Islands, which we have many, over 450,000 companies are registered here. If you are a company registered in the British Virgin Islands, you must demonstrate that you have some form of economic substance here, meaning you got to have an operation taking place in the British Virgin Islands. Imagine 450,000 companies registered here having an operation in the British Virgin Islands. An operation, as we, we could not determine what it meant, what is substance. No one was able to, to define substance. Many people have different concepts of what substance is. Substance really should mean that your headquarters are based here. Some people thought that maybe we can get away with saying that somebody has a little office in a, an office in a 15 by 10 room and they represent 40 companies by having a phone number that you can call and say, well, this is, you know, this is um, Nike, this is Starbucks, this is McDonald's or whomever. And that's, that's as much as it goes, that's as far as it goes. McDonald's has a phone number in the British Virgin Islands so they have substance. We still don't know what it is. Or like I said, you can have an office employing 10, 15, 20 people. But that's what the European Union has imposed upon us. And we're still trying to work out what substance really means. And that happened since December 2018. Now, when they start enforcing and insisting that we comply and the British government is nowhere around, where does that leave us? So that's why our government has to always have that forward thinking and know where their strengths are. If that doesn't, you can, if there, you can, you can also close your eyes and pretend it doesn't, it doesn't happen. It's not happening. And next thing you know, what the French did to us will happen. We get blacklisted. So we have to make sure that we keep our eyes open and um, and and see to these things happening. I want this community, I want this district to become active, active in the matters that concern you. There is a racetrack, Elistamas Downs up in Sikau's Bay. I wonder how many of you are involved in anything that goes on at Elistamas Downs. But it's in your community. The hurricane came and it destroyed Elistamas Downs, knocked the, 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 the grandstands, the roof, everything is gone up there. It's just a shell of what, what we had. We, not, we, we as a community need to get together and tell the government, you know, it's two years gone and we see no sign of anything happening to this, this, this grand, these grandstands coming back. What are we going to do about it? Communities, committees need to be formed. Active, to be activists for things to be done in the district. Same thing I talk about with the harbor when I was talking about the dredging and getting that, that silt out of the bay. Those are the kind of things that we're going to have to do if we want to bring, breathe life back into this community. Your community is no different, no different from the rest. They're all the same. After the hurricane, paralysis has set in, and you know we, we just got to get it going again. Agriculture, we got some farmers in here. We got farmers, farmers in this place. Agriculture, one, we got a goat sheep. You're a farmer? You got farmers in the place, and there's no farming. Agriculture is just, has been wiped off the map completely. It, it's gonna take, it's gonna take a getting together and a voicing of opinion to make sure that these things, these things come back. I, I, I give the example earlier. This, this locomotive is no longer running down the track smooth. All the tracks it passed are gone and there's not, no, no indication of what's ahead. Starting almost from scratch. You gotta work together, we gotta do it together. Okay? I think that, um, anyone have any questions? You're free to ask. Uh,
this is this is not this is not gloom and doom now. It's not gloom and doom. Evening, everyone. While you're making your to-do list, can we have lights? Please? Oh yes. I walk early in the morning from time to time, and there's no lights. Oh yes. And I drive late at night, and there's no lights. So can I please have lights? Please. I, 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 I can appreciate that. Just this evening I was driving home, I was driving up here, and I said, oh my God. I wrote, I wrote the, the, the uh, general manager of BVI Electricity just, just this week about lights. And I, and, and it's not that you're asking for something you didn't have. Those lights were there before. All the lights, it's just a matter of replacing the lights. Yes, I will reinforce that request by asking again about it and, and bringing it up. Me again. Um, going back to marijuana, something that interests me, although I know very little about it, and you admitted the same. Does anybody here know anything about growing marijuana? Without convicting yourselves. <laughs> I'd like to know how much acreage of plants it takes to make, say, 100 milliliters of medical content that is of use for the medicinal purposes. And whether we have such an acreage that's going to make selling it a viable proposition. And the other subject I'd like you to mention is what do you think about the drag racing project? Drag racing. Yeah, I got that. One thing I used to hear about marijuana, you know, in the United States, where those guys go up in the mountains and they have this little patch through the bush, through the woods, and you, you, you would know where they are because marijuana consumes a lot of water and it has a thirst for light. So when they, when they label it as miracle, medical marijuana, I don't know if it's different from the other marijuana that I've been... Uh, if, it's gonna, if it's gonna require this amount of water, where they're gonna get it from and all these kind of things. I, I, that's why I said I, I don't know enough about it to make an intelligent comment regarding it. So I, I think that enough talk about it has been made it's now time for the government to come out and get all the experts. I noticed you, you put a call out for anyone who knows about it, but no one, no one in this room at least seemed to know, <laughs> seemed to know anything about it. So I'm not, I'm not alone when it comes to not knowing about this, this stuff. Uh, your other question on the drag racing. You know, there's a time for everything. I believe there's a time in your, li in your life for everything, maybe not in the world for everything. I think that th those, those people, those persons who are between a certain age and uh, of a certain status might be inclined to want to see those things, just like I did at some point in my life wanting to see these things. In, in other communities, where you come from, for instance, big communities, big countries, I should say, these things happen. They happen all the time, but they're not in your backyard. So it doesn't, as far as you're concerned, it's not happening. Here now, you talk about drag racing. The, question you, the questions, there are more questions than answers. Where are you going to put it? Once you say where you're going to put it, then you're going to have a different argument as to why here and why there. The younger generation, we have to allow, or we have to allow space in our communities for the youth, for young people. We have to. And if it's motorcycles, drag racing, jet skis, it comes down to a question, the question comes down to are we big enough to accommodate these things? Once the studies are done 
and the results come out. You, the people, are the ones who need to make these decisions. I am an advocate for one thing and one thing only, for the people making the decision. Now, we have referenda legislation. Your legislation is there. Put it to a referendum. Put it to a referendum. It's a democracy still, the majority supposed to rule. I don't believe that any government should take it upon themselves and make these, these, these controversial decisions. So, you wouldn't be asking me, you, if you ask me my opinion, on, if you ask anyone in the, the audience in attendance their opinion on drag race, they'll give you an opinion. But if the majority of them said they don't want it, you don't get it. And that's my philosophy with, to politics. I say when I, was a, when I got into politics first, my concept was the me, me, me. It was just me. I go to bed at night saying I'm going to do something. I wake up the next morning and I say I'm going to do it. I never took into consideration what does the people want? And then after being there for so long, you, you start saying to yourself, hey, this thing is not yours. It belongs to the people. So I believe in coming to you and asking you what you want. Would you agree for this to happen? What would you say if I was supposed to do this? And you said no. I, there are a lot of things that people have said no to. And I just back off on it. So... I understood that they have already passed the law for the motorcycles to be on the road, the, the bigger bikes. I haven't seen the legislation, so I, I don't know, but I understood it's already passed. You know, you, you have to, the, the things that you're looking at and consider to be uh, so, so inappropriate, the things that are so inappropriate and you see happening, you consider them to be illegal and that the police officers are not doing their jobs and so on and so forth. But you need to understand why. A police officer would tell you that Stopping a guy for not wearing a helmet is a decent waste of time because the penalty is $10 and if a guy could ride his bike in the course of a year and he gets, 10, stop, gets stopped 10 times at $10, that's $100. Yeah, but and, and he, this guy riding the bike is only concerned about one thing, looking good. And he figured the amount of girls that are going to see him and like him because he wasn't wearing a helmet and the $100, he's not going to wear the helmet. And the police officer is not going to change him, chase him either. Okay. In terms of cost effectiveness, we think about safety. He falls off that bike. We're not sure he's going to survive. And who is it costing in terms of his health care? We said that we don't have money for NHI. So all those factors we need to look at. But we just let them go and do whatever. Next thing, we are flying them out to Puerto Rico, Jamaica, wherever, because we can't handle the type of care they need here. So it costs. And this is why we have to look at the cost. Do we want to deal with the after effects? Because when he falls off a bike, we are talking about head injuries. If I don't wear my seatbelt, I get a ticket for that, isn't it? I want to let you know that our community, our community by and large, by and large, is one 
of lawlessness and is highly tolerated. And one of the reasons one of the reasons it's being tolerated is that people don't want to be bothered. So they allow things to happen. They just don't want to be bothered. You know what a police officer said to me? An ex-police officer in the BVI. He said to me that he's not in favor with officers wearing guns. And, uh, well, I didn't even have to ask him. He went on to say that if officers get guns, the criminals will get guns too. As if they don't already have guns. But the point he was trying to make is that the criminal will be more prone to challenge the police if he had a gun than if he didn't. In other words, the police will be sitting there the criminal walk by him with the gun, the police ain't gonna bother him, and he ain't gonna bother the police. So you gotta understand crime and criminality. And this is how, this is how we, the, the whole thing with the helmet, the guy is never gonna wear a helmet because the police ain't gonna stop him. And the police gonna tell you that it's useless stopping him because it's only $10 fine. Now what's it to the police what the fine is? Hmm? It's not his business, he's still getting paid. But he, there's his alibi. And the politician who's supposed to be making the law ain't changing the law. Maybe the guy riding the, the cycle is his, his friend. I don't know. So this little society that we live in needs a lot of coming together. And the things that you preach in church on Sunday you're going to have to practice it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And the day we start doing that, this little community that we have here becomes a model. Nobody would want, nobody would want to be arguing about whether we're going to be betting on the track or whether we're going to have uh, drag racing or whether we're going to have motorcycles and helmets and all that. You got to be careful when you say that because your, your son might be one of those who wants to ride a cycle. Everybody. <laughs> okay, um, let's get it. the time is spent and I think that this evening was quite a productive one. I still want to maintain that I thank the BVI Red Cross for joining me this evening. I thank the media for joining me and you wonderful people for coming out to hear what I had to say and share your thoughts and views and a pleasant good evening to all of you. Good night.